I had a pretty scary experience with my husband. This happened about a year and a half ago. I've always been a huge paranormal fanatic. I would always find places to go explore that were known to be haunted, which means I have a lot of stories, but this one is by far my most scary. In my home state, there's an abandoned asylum on the outskirts of downtown, in a pretty sketchy area. The building was originally a mental health facility in the 40s, and was eventually made into a drug rehab center, and finally a boy's home where it would eventually shut down in the 80s. It's a relatively small building, only two stories, and maybe eight rooms on each floor, and one large room on both floors on the far side of the building, all windows busted out. The building has a history filled with tragedy and has a well-known reputation to be haunted. I've been to the building on a handful of occasions, but had never been on the bottom floor due to flooding. I had never had any experiences there except maybe a feeling of unease. There was a day I had asked my husband if we could go. He was hesitant at first as we had been there a few months before. We usually went every six months just for fun, but he eventually agreed and said he wanted to go at 3am. Me being me, I agree with him. 2am rolls around and we're at the asylum with our baseball bats, for protection. As I mentioned, in sketchy areas, occasionally we'd run into homeless sleeping there, so it's just a precaution. I also had brought a Ouija board and an EMF reader. This time that we visited, the water on the bottom floor had drained out and I was very excited to finally go down there and explore it. We started upstairs and swept the whole building, making sure nobody was there. While sweeping the bottom floor, I didn't have any feelings of unease, but I was a little freaked out to see satanic symbols and dead birds on the floor. At this point, I had figured that the downstairs hadn't been flooded for a few months, as there was a lot of graffiti and the dirt on the floor was dry. We started on the upstairs with candles and the Ouija board, and tried to make contact for nearly an hour. Nothing. Nothing on the EMF, nothing on the board. At this point, my husband and I are just bullshitting around because we weren't expecting anything to happen, just having fun. We moved downstairs and by that time it was about 3am. I was feeling fine at first and we did a few sessions on the Ouija board in different areas of the lower floor. I had asked to stay away from the large back room as the satanic symbols had made me uncomfortable. After the sessions, we walked around with the EMF detector and I noticed it was only spiking in the spots we had the Ouija board sitting. My husband and I were pretty weirded out, but we just kind of blew it off and thought there was maybe an explanation. My husband decided he wanted to go to the back room. I said it was fine as long as he stayed close to me. We made it a little more than halfway when I started to get a gut feeling to not go any further. Every hair on my body was standing on end. I told my husband that we needed to go and I noticed he was on edge as well. I ended up running down the hall back to the outside alone. It was unlike me to go anywhere alone in the dark as I'm terrified of it, but this feeling was too much for me. When my husband and I were both back in the car and I had calmed down, he explained to me that he had felt the most evil feeling or presence he had felt since a previous haunting he had dealt with. We were both pretty freaked out and decided we were done for the night and wanted to go home. About three nights later, I woke up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. When I was coming back from the bathroom, I had a weird feeling, but I wasn't completely awake so I ignored it. When I reached the bedroom and closed the door behind me, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked over to the corner of our room and I saw a hunched shadow figure, not much taller than my 5'4". I stared for a second but told myself I was half asleep and went back to bed feeling a little uneasy. About a week later, my husband asked to talk to me. He told me that he had seen something in the bedroom the night I had gotten up to use the bathroom as I had woken him up getting out of bed. He began describing what he saw and I was in utter disbelief because we had both seen the exact same thing. When I asked why he didn't say anything that night, he said he thought he was imagining it. 
Needless to say, we were both scared shitless after that, and I think our fear fed more into the situation. It went to us seeing the figure almost every other night, our ankles being grabbed, and things being moved around and found out of place for the next few weeks. There came a point when I was so fed up that I smudged with two different smudge sticks and very angrily told it to leave us the fuck alone. After that, it just went away. Gone. Like it never happened. To this day, I believe it followed us home from the asylum, as we have never had issues in our house before and always left the Ouija board in the car. I had a strict rule about it coming into the house. Do I think the spirit was the same entity we felt that night? No, but I definitely felt it came from the asylum. I think this was a spirit that just wanted to mess with us, nothing malevolent. To this day, we haven't returned to the asylum. Even thinking about it over a year later, I can still feel the pit in my stomach of when I felt that evil entity that night. This happened about seven years ago, but I still remember it like it happened yesterday. I was maybe 16 at the time and super into the paranormal. I grew up in the church and was told time and time again that the paranormal did not exist outside of the realm of just demons and angels. So, as any curious teenager who had to find out for themselves, my friend and I snuck out to buy a Ouija board. The two of us then drove out and parked on a deserted dirt road so there would be no chance of either of our religious parents finding out what we were doing. Because, as you would assume, a Ouija board was a big no-no. The two of us climbed in the back seat of our car and set out the board. I think about an hour went by of absolutely nothing happening, besides one of us getting jittery and moving the planchet slightly. Then it started moving. It was slow but it gave a year and spelled rape. That was it. We tried to ask questions, but no response. We said goodbye and drove to a grocery store and threw the board away. I looked up the year and sexual assault cases in our area and unfortunately found one. The case happened in the late 1970s, so I couldn't find much information, but I was definitely unsettled and overwhelmingly confused on why this was communicated with us. Went home that night, felt super anxious, and had a hard time falling asleep, but nothing happened. Nothing happened for three weeks following that night. Before I get into what occurred, I need to describe my bedroom at the time. When you come in the door to my room, there's a closet on the left and then my bed is a few feet away, tucked into the corner of the wall. Straight ahead is a big window, and to the right is a desk and dresser. On the left wall, starting at the door and going around to my bed, there was a line of posters and records, with a bulletin board right above the head of my bed. The right side wall is covered with even more. So anyway, I come home from school and go about my business. That night I went to bed, still feeling uneasy, but fell asleep rather quickly. When I wake up in the morning and roll over, I feel multiple sharp stabs on my side. I sat up and saw that the bulletin board had fallen down right next to my head, and the tacks were all over my bed and stabbing into me. I looked around my room and felt chills. The posters and records from the doorway to my bed on the left wall had all fallen off. The ones on the other wall were all still up, not even crooked. I checked around the rest of the house, especially rooms sharing that wall, and nothing else had been displaced in the slightest. So... To me, it seems that something had come into my room, knocked everything off the wall moving towards my bed, and stopped when it was right over my head while I slept. I'll start with events that began to occur when I was dating my first real girlfriend, back when I was in my early 20s, about seven-ish years ago. My girlfriend had always told me she was haunted, and at the time, I was much more of a skeptic than I am now. Our apartment was on the top floor of a small building. There were only three stories and four apartments per floor. Weird stuff had tended to happen around the apartment from time to time. Most notably, a picture that we had hung on the wall always seemed to fall off its hook with some level of regularity. 
I chalked it up to it just not sitting on the hook very well. But sometimes we'd come home and find it quite far across the room, sitting on the floor which I couldn't explain. We also had three cats at the time, and they all seemed to, at different times, stare at the same corner of the room, of the ceiling. They would sit there for long periods, just staring into the empty corner. These things were weird, up until this point, but things got far creepier. One night, my brother and his then time fiance, now wife, came over for a visit. My sister-in-law claimed to be very strong spiritually, and she and my girlfriend decided it would be a good idea to play with a Ouija board, which I'm sure I don't have to tell you it's a bad idea for the inexperienced. My sister-in-law and girlfriend were able to make contact with something, something that answered questions that I asked that neither of them could possibly know. I wanted to test to see if they were messing with me and my brother. I asked what my recently passed grandfather had told me before he died. The correct answer. I, who was working as an EMT at the time, asked about a patient who had died that none of them ever knew about. Correct answer. At the time, I was understandably creeped out. The board even accurately predicted some future events that have come and passed. It told us that my patients followed me around for some time after they passed, before they moved on. I also said that the corner that the cats were always staring at was the place in our apartment where the spirits of my grandfather and girlfriend's mother congregated. Unfortunately, it was the stuff that happened in the months and years after we had played that were truly unnerving. From that night on, things escalated. The first thing was that the picture on the wall began falling off with much greater regularity and travelled much further. One day, while sitting in the living room, the picture flew off the wall and landed completely across the room. We were so startled that we stopped putting the picture back on the wall and left it leaning on our fireplace from then on. Being that we lived in an apartment, the hallway light outside of our apartment was always on, and looking at the front door at night, you could see the light from the hallway shining under the door. One night, we started noticing that you could see two breaks in the light, like someone was standing right outside our door. We investigated many times, trying to figure out what was going on. We moved everything away from the door, thinking it was just our doormat. It was still there. We opened the door several times, thinking maybe someone was actually out there, but the hallway was always empty and quiet. We even tried sneaking up to the door every, very quietly and peeking through the peephole, thinking maybe someone was pranking us. We never saw anyone or anything. The worst part was that the shadows came and went. They weren't always there, but became so regular that at night, if I had to go to the bathroom, I'd make a point of not looking towards the door, because I didn't want to see if whatever it was was there. The fire alarm system in the building at that time started to go wonky as well. We had lived there for a year before we used a Ouija board and never had issue, but after that night, the alarm for the whole building would randomly start to go off in the middle of the night, but wouldn't shut off until the fire department showed up and shut it off. They came to the door after the third or fourth time it happened and asked if we were alright. We said yes and asked what was going on. He said they had no idea, but the system kept on getting activated for no reason. Cupboard doors in our kitchen would open on their own, and our Google Home would start talking to no one and say things like, I can't do that, when no one had spoken or even made a noise. One time it even made a really loud and strange squeaking noise. After that, we unplugged it and never plugged it back in. While I was working out of town for a while, my girlfriend was finishing her last year of university. We would text all day and video chat at night. She told me on two occasions that something had woken her up and she couldn't explain. Once, she said she was woken up to the sound of someone clapping once right behind her head. She was so scared she froze and didn't move and didn't roll over to look out of fear. Second time, she said she was woken out of deep sleep by the sound of a woman screaming in her ear. She was terrified and I felt so helpless because I was at least a nine hour drive away. A couple years later we broke up, and I'm now living alone in a townhouse. By the way, not the first time I've lived alone, in the town close to the main city. The previous tenant went through some hard times, 
became unable to pay their rent and ended up basically fleeing the house in the middle of the night. They must have left some bad energy behind. From the first night after I moved in, I found that there was a weird energy to some of the rooms and the main floor made you feel unwelcome and uncomfortable at night. It makes you feel anxious when you're down there alone. It got to the point where I wouldn't stay down there at night. I'd go up to my room and stay there all night. I thought for a long time that it was just me being scared just because I was by myself in the house. That was until I started dating my next girlfriend who said that she felt the same way when she was down there at night, even when I was home. She's quite a spiritual person and actively does spiritual practices. She felt the house had a frightened energy about it, like imagining the energy of a scared child, which was exactly how I would describe it. The last major thing to happen was about two or three months before we moved out. We were sitting downstairs on the main floor watching TV. My girlfriend was sitting on the other couch and had her hand hanging down when she said that something cold passed her hand. She sat up and put her hand out and said it was like a cloud of cold air and it was moving. I put my hand out and felt it. It was like running your hand through cold fog. We followed for about a minute before it disappeared. We never experienced anything like that again. Since moving, nothing strange or unexplained has happened, knock on wood. I'm now a firm believer and I've had the skeptic scared right out of me. I'm really into all things spooky and was thinking about trying a Ouija board. I wanted to make sure I didn't mess anything up, so I spent the whole day just researching it. That night, when I went to sleep, I woke up at 3am. I woke up at least one time in the middle of the night every night, so I don't think anything of it. But whenever I closed my eyes, I kept having the strangest visualization. As soon as I closed my eyes, it was like I was above my headboard looking down on myself, sleeping. And on the left side of my bed, there were these two shadow looking people standing over myself in the bed. I immediately opened my eyes and looked, and of course nothing was there. But whenever I closed my eyes, the next couple times it was the same thing. I haven't seen anything like that since that night, but I still remember clearly what the scene was. Is that what astral projection is, or could that just be a dream? The reason it feels like it wasn't a dream was that I immediately saw it once I closed my eyes. Usually it'll be black until I start dreaming, but it didn't feel like a dream. I can tell you that myself in the bed did not see what I was seeing and did not know they were there. Also, do you think that they were two negative beings coming to me because I'd spent all day surrounding my mind with the paranormal? Or do you think that it was two positive beings kind of trying to warn me not to mess with the board? and scared me by accident. How is a Ouija board used? Essentially, two or more people channel their energy into the planchette and determine who they'd like to contact in the realm of the dead. By opening the door, they now have the ability to have questions answered or information given to them by spirits or demons at hand. No pun intended. Opening this portal could be dangerous and thus must be closed by saying goodbye on the board at the end of a session. Giving yourself and the spirits closure to any sort of communication. References to Ouija in popular media. Here we have a list of a few sources of spookiness given to the board through movies or TV shows. Ouija boards have figured prominently in horror tales in various media as devices enabling malevolent spirits to spook their users. Most often, they make brief appearances, relying heavily on the atmosphere of mystery the board already holds in the mind of the viewer, in order to add credence to the paranormal presence in the story being told. What Lies Beneath includes a seance scene with a board. Paranormal activity involves a violent entity haunting a couple that becomes more powerful when the Ouija board is used. Another 2007 film, Ouija, depicted a group of adolescents whose use the board caused a murderous spirit to follow them. While four years later, the Ouija experiment portrayed a group of friends whose use of the board opens and fails to close a portal between the worlds of the living and the dead. 
The 2014 film Ouija featured a group of friends whose use of the board prompted a series of deaths. The film was followed by a 2016 prequel, Ouija Origin of Evil, which also features the device. I Am Zozo follows a group of people that run afoul of a demon based on Pazuzu after using a Ouija board. The British singer Morrissey released a controversial single titled Ouija Board, Ouija Board in 1989. The lyrics and the video of the song mockingly play with the idea of supernaturally contacting dead persons. A Ouija board is an early part of the plot of the 1973 horror film The Exorcist. Using a Ouija board, the young girl Regan makes what first appears to be harmless contact with an entity named Captain Howdy. She later becomes possessed by a demon. Why does the board speak to me? Well, in short, it doesn't. You speak to you. The Ouija board works on the well-documented ideometer phenomenon. The ideometer phenomenon is a psychological phenomenon wherein a subject makes motions unconsciously. Also called ideomotor response or ideomotor reflex and abbreviated to IMR, it's a concept in hypnosis and psychological research. It's derived from the terms idio, idea or mental representation, and motor, muscular action. The phrase is most commonly used in reference to the process whereby a thought or mental image brings about a seemingly reflexive or automatic muscular reaction, often of minuscule degree, and potentially outside of the awareness of the subject. As in reflexes responses to pain, the body sometimes reacts reflexively with an idiomotor effect to ideas alone without the person consciously deciding to take action. The effects of automatic writing, dowsing, facilitated communication and Ouija boards have been attributed to the phenomenon. The blindfold experiment. Recently, a working Ouija board being used by a group of people that had made contact with an entity was held under scrutiny. How, you may ask? The participants were simply blindfolded after using the board to receive clear answers from the spirits. Take a look and see what happens once their sight is taken away. Spoiler alert, the spirits lose all power, probably due to the board not being a portal to a different dimension. Keep in mind, this is all supposed to be a form of a seance. Let's touch on that next. Seances, the Philip experiment. In 1972, a blind experiment slash study was performed to prove or disprove the ability to contact the dead under lab conditions. The experiment was conducted by a Toronto parapsychological research society led by mathematical geneticist Dr. A.R. George Owen and overseen by psychologist Dr. Joel Whitten. The test group consisted of Owen's wife, Iris Owen, former chairperson of Mensa in Canada, Margaret Sparrow, industrial designer Andy H., his wife Lorne, heating engineer Al Peacock, accountant Benice M., bookkeeper Dorothy O'Donnell, and sociology student Sidney Kay. Their goals were to create a fictional character through a purposeful methodology and then attempt to communicate with it through seance. The character created and agreed upon was named Philip Aylesford, referred to as Philip during the test. His fictional history partially coincided with actual events and places, but with multiple contradictions and errors. He was born in 1624 in England, had an early military career and was knighted by the age of 16. He was involved in the English Civil War and became personal friends with Charles II, working for him as a spy. Philip was unhappily married to a woman named Dorothea and later fell in love with a Romany girl who was accused of witchcraft and burned at the stake. In despair, Philip committed suicide in 1654 at the age of 30. The group was seated around a table with initial seances yielding no contact, no communication and no phenomenon. Owen changed test conditions by dimming lights and changing the environment to mimic that of a more traditional seance. Participants began feeling a presence, table vibrations, breezes, unexplained echoes, and rapping sounds which matched responses to questions about Philip's life. At one point, the table tilted on a single leg, and at other times, 
moved across the room without human contact. Although audio, video and witness accounts documents the paranormal phenomena, Philip never appeared to the participants. In conclusion, ghosts, demons and spirits do not, have not and will not ever come through a Ouija board or medium to contact us. This is a tested phenomenon, can be attributed to science and is completely mundane. Don't worry, you playing with the board one night over some wine and candles is totally safe and perhaps fun. Nothing can hurt you by doing it. There's a lot to unpack. So let's start with the story my mother told me about her basement. Some context and history might be needed though. Once upon a time, my grandmother was batshit insane. From my understanding, she's always had problem with pills and such. It ended up being the death of her. Just before I was born, her apartment caught fire. The doorknob fell off and she was too high to get out. My mom swears it's a murder case. My grandfather was a war vet and would whip the five children in the house relentlessly. You're probably wondering what that has to do with anything. And quite frankly, it's just so you can understand the setting that my mom grew up in. They didn't give a shit and when they did, it was in the wrong way. My grandmother was super into Wiccan, black magic, witchcraft and all that. My mom said she was very Catholic religious as well, which after some of the things that have happened to me, I don't fucking blame her. Apparently this rubbed off on her kids though, because two of the five also dabbed in such things, my aunt Linda and my uncle Carrie. My mom always tried to keep us as far away from the people she grew up with as humanly possible. Everyone who grew up in that house ended up terrible addicts or crazies. They first moved into the house in the 1970s, and it was the early 80s when the children lived in the basement. They would put the girls downstairs and the boys upstairs since they tended to need more discipline. My mom says that they used to have this chair, just sort of chilling in the bedroom. It didn't really have a purpose and was typically just a catch-all for clothes that were still clean or the occasional parent visiting their room. One night, when she was probably no older than 10, my mother and my aunt are waiting for sleep to come, when Linda's voice cracks out in the silence. Mickey, do you see that? Or something along those lines, I'm sure. Half awake, my mom takes the covers off of her head to see an angelic looking woman, sitting daintily on the now empty chair. She only ever described her beautifully, but her tone of voice telling the story always gave me a sense that as beautiful as she may have been, every beauty came off wrong, as if there were air quotes around the scene itself. My aunt began talking to the angel. My aunt is older than my mother. Maybe that's why she felt no need to be afraid. My mother listened to this one-sided conversation, head under the covers. The first look was real enough that she wanted no part in it. She began to hear the angel start to address her. The angel asked her why she's hiding, asked her to look, asked her to talk, etc. My mother says it felt like her guts was full of rocks. As she refused and ignored, the voice began to change. The angel was begging her. Then it began telling her, then demanding, and then screaming. My mother stayed under the covers and prayed, whilst Linda continued a conversation with the same woman technically, but a different voice. My mom never spoke to it that night and didn't see it as much as Linda did after that day. Linda on the other hand would chat with her many times after that night. When the girl's room was moved upstairs, so did the angel. My mom to this day will not allow the room to be arranged a certain way. Meeting Linda as an adult was a trip. She had this small book and would go out onto our porch and read or pray out loud. She was a terrible addict and passed away from an overdose last year. Her daughter, who's very similar, left some of her ashes in a zippy bag on our porch. She's chilling on top of our china cabinet in the kitchen now, rest her soul. My mom says my uncle Carrie got into devil worship at the house, sacrificing small animals and such. She said at some point it had gotten bad enough. She'd find hung kittens or catch him suffocating something or another. 
absolutely insane shit. She says it was his worship and my grandmother's black magic that he had opened some sort of portal. He died in 2011 from full body cancer at 32. When my grandpa died of cancer in 2012, my mother was the only one of his children to take care of him in his last days. So we left the house to her. We had been renting and hopping around most of my elementary years, so my mom took it as an opportunity to save some money. She wanted to settle somewhere that wasn't her childhood home and didn't give a terrible PTSD. He officially died in the hospital, but his last days were spent in our living room in a hospital bed. I'm writing this in what used to be her room, the nine by nine office space that I painted when I was 10. I don't remember when exactly I started sleeping with the door shut, but I remember why. At first, I'd wake up and see my mom going to the bathroom. I always found it strange that she could just get up and go back to sleep like that. She spooked me several times by peeking her head in to check up on me. But there was a time where I woke up for no reason, expecting to see my mother scuffling to the bathroom in a shirt and instead staring into pitch black. It was as if my nightlight stopped at my door. I remember being so puzzled at first, simply thinking it was a weird way the door caught the light or something. But a sense of dread was starting to make the hairs on my neck raise. It was so unnaturally black. Didn't I used to be able to see my mother's face at the doorway? Didn't I used to see her go to the bathroom? Why can't I see the table in the hall like I usually can? The more questions I realised I didn't have answers for, the more intense the feeling of doom became. Taking a page out of my mother's book, I hid under the covers until morning. I wake up and I'm talking about it with my mom, right? And she tells me a story about myself I hardly remembered. When I was really little, I refused to sleep alone in our old trailer. My mom would often come and sleep with me until she woke up to pee and would go back to her own bed. I've always been such a deep sleeper, so she knew she wouldn't wake me. Tonight, I woke up at 3am to see a person at the foot of my bed. They could have touched my mom's foot if they reached out. I remember it just being this silhouette, impossibly dark. I've always had nightlights because I'm a little bitch. So I've no idea how it was such a shadow. I remember I felt like it wasn't allowed to look at it. So I stared at my feet, barely taking in the figure in the edges of my vision. I touched my mother to wake her up, such a light sleeper and she prayed with me to make it go away. I'm currently not religious in the traditional sense, so I have no idea why this worked. When I opened my eyes from the prayer, the entity that had been there giving me chills for the past like 10 minutes was suddenly gone. No more shadow. I always thought I was just tripping as a kid. My mom totally would have freaked out if that was something, right? So when I talked to her about the shadow I had seen in our hall, the hairs on her arms stand up, and she tells me that she's seen it too. That night, when I was a child, she told me to tell it to go away in the name of God. What I didn't know is that she had seen it and stopped seeing it at the same time I had. Once I started sleeping with the door shut, shit got weird. When I'd get home from school, my closet would be wide open. I used to be super messy, so I assumed that it couldn't have just been a broken latch. How would it have pushed the clothes and shoes back like that? Then it started happening at night. I'd usually wake up and see the closet wide open, pitch fluck fucking black. I was a little older at this point, but still I know better than to try and look at its face. I feel like that's just common sense at that point if you're realistically experiencing some sort of paranormal activity. I didn't always feel the sense of dread. Sometimes it was just creepy as hell. It wasn't until I woke up one night as it was opening that I felt sick. I watched that door open to about an inch crack, nearly pissed myself. I started putting laundry baskets and piles of clothes in front of it. I shit you not, it would still manage to open. I'd often just push the door to see if it had come unlatched and the answer was almost always yes. My mum thought we'd trade it out for a different doorknob with a lock. Then the new thing was the button being unlocked. It's one of those push button locks that unlocks when you twist it and makes a sort of clunk noise. You can unlock it from the other side by jabbing a bobby pin or something. I'd wake up hearing this super specific noise and find the closet unlocked. 
Even stranger is when I'd hear this noise, yet the door is still locked. Sometimes I'd hear it twice. Makes zero sense. Sometimes I'd wake up in my mom's bed and neither of us would know how I got there. We're talking middle school era when most teens would rather be caught dead than still sleeping in their parents' bed. And she's a light sleeper, so she would have noticed. She's had a priest literally bless our home and burn sage regularly, even though she's the most Karen person you'd ever meet. So here's the deal. The point of you knowing all of that is that so you know why I wanted a Ouija board in the first place. It's not for the hella dead relatives. I never got the chance to talk to. Then to figure out what the hell was going on when I was a kid. So of course, I went into the Halloween spirit and blew 40 bucks so my friend Alex and I can have a shot at it. And don't even judge me. If all of that backstory was true for you too, you'd be just as curious. I had done a bunch of research at this point, trying to find out what the rules typically are. Stories, guides, history, anything. But there's something weird about the search results for Ouija boards. Why are there so many cheesy magazines writing about it? Why can I find anywhere on Reddit with current discussions on Ouija? Some people have asked, but responses are usually pretty weak. Why isn't it common knowledge that there have been Ouija boards long before America even? Why aren't more people still talking about this, even just as a party game? We've used the board three times now, twice yesterday, all during the day at around 2 or 3pm. Here are some notable things that have happened that I can remember right now. We need to start writing everything down. Originally, said they were eight. Kept moving to the black next to the word goodbye or would move to the moon on the board. When asked if it moving to the black spaces was because it's shy, it said yes. Asked if the moon meant we should do this at night, yes. At some point, we had gotten the giggles from smoking beforehand. Her boyfriend Jay is a skeptic and was making fun. And when we tried to apologize, the board said no. Kept talking to us after a minute though. When asked for a name, moved to zero. When asked if they would tell us how old they are again, said yes, then X, then zero. When asked for gender, zero. I can't remember the context and wish I had better notes, but once in a while, it would go to M. Originally very weak. Moved very slow to the sun. I assumed it was telling us we forgot the candle. Actually started working better once we lit a candle. Told us name was D. Was using the in-between of yes and no as a maybe. Said yes, it does miss the cats. Said maybe, it likes it when people are down here. Said yes, the cats are still here. Moved to the black space. When her boyfriend Jay the skeptic came home, the board said goodbye. LED lights started glitching. We said goodbye to fix them quickly. When asked for age, it began slowly and steadily moving through the numbers. And I got a bad feeling it was going to go through all the numbers. So we moved it back to the top. Tried going through the alphabet next. This time, Alex got the bad feeling and wouldn't let it finish. K. A, T, the sun, S. When asked for a name, D. At first we thought Jay was messing with us because he hadn't done it with us until this reading. But we didn't tell him about the second time we had just used it yet. Definitely not told him someone by D had talked to us in the basement. I came home and started noticing these black rocks everywhere. Little pocket sized black stones in the corners of rooms. Usually I would have recognised right away they were warding stones. I like to research stuff like that, even if I don't believe in it 100%. Just because I like that era and enjoy the aesthetic of it all. But for some reason, I started picking up these rocks and I had four of them before I remembered what they were. Which is odd, not like me. I'm not trying to imply anything, but it was noticeably something I wouldn't do. Overall, I could just be crazy. Maybe it's hereditary. But now I'm obsessed with researching the Ouija board and the things it tells us. I feel like I've got a mystery that needs solved and what better place to figure it out than the public internet. If there's a scientific explanation for this. We're doing another session tomorrow in my basement this time. So far, we've been doing it at Alex's house, but she legit just texted me that her metal Guinness sign that's been hanging just fine for years 
fell without nothing touching it. We've been friends since our childhood. One day, when we were in our 12th grade, she came running to me and told me she found a few guys smoking weed in a nearby abandoned house. And when she caught them red-handed, they had offered her some. I asked her to be careful and told her that we would speak about that later in the day. She didn't turn up to our regular meetup spot that evening. I was worried and went to her home where I found her. She was high on weed and her parents were yelling at her. The time she spent with me gradually reduced after that. One evening, I saw her entering that abandoned house all alone, and when I followed her, I saw her using a Ouija board along with her new friends. I left that place and returned home without letting her know. When I met her the next day and told her I was worried about her newfound friends, as they appeared shady, she got angry and told me that I was not her dad to interfere in her personal life. Our conversation reduced further after that, and we stopped talking eventually. I had to leave the town after securing admission to a good university. I got a call late in the evening from her, and I was excited, as it was over six months since we last spoke. When I answered the call, I heard her panting. She said she was being followed by a creepy old woman who was trying to kill her. When I asked her to inform her parents, she said, I told them, George but they're not able to see her and blame her on me using drugs. I asked her to go to a well-populated place and told her I'd come to meet her as soon as possible. I went to her house the next day and crashed that night as I had travelled more than 250 miles. When I woke up, I saw her relieved face. She started crying and explained to me what was going through. One day, when they were playing with a Ouija board in that abandoned house I had mentioned earlier, one of her friends started to act weird. She was mumbling something in Latin, which was a language she actually didn't know. The board had apparently started to burn, and they had rushed out without closing the session the right way. After that incident, she had been seeing an old woman with a knife who was threatening to kill her. I first thought she was seeing all this because of her drug abuse, and decided to stay with her and help her out. I requested a break from my studies at my university and stayed with her in her house after that. One night, when I was fast asleep, I heard someone knocking rapidly on the door of my room. When I opened it, I saw the pale, crying face of my friend. She pointed at her room and said that the old woman was in her room. When I went into her room along with her, I saw an old woman whose attire was from the 60s run at us with a knife. She magically disappeared when we closed our eyes. We were both scared to death and slept together in my room. When I spoke to her mom about what I had seen the next day, she laughed and asked me to joke early in the morning. None of our family believed in us and we were left hopeless. We started seeing that ghost roam around the house in broad daylight, even in front of her family members, but no one else was able to see it. We started seeing leave her and save your life scratched on my room door. And when we showed it to her parents, they got furious at us as they thought we were pulling a prank on them. It was a new moon night and we were in my room chatting about all the memories we had gathered. The clock struck 12 and we decided to sleep as it was already late. I woke up to nature's call and when I opened my eyes, I saw a silhouette that was so tall that it hit the ceiling of the room. Standing near my friend's side of the bed. It was staring at her with a knife in its hand. I tried shouting, but my voice didn't come out of my throat. I turned on the lights and the figure disappeared. I woke up my friend and asked her not to sleep until I came back from the toilet. I came back and told her what I saw. She wasn't too worried as she was used to it by then. We decided to let the lights turn on the whole night and lay down to sleep again. In a while, the light started flickering and burst which woke me up but my friend was still sound asleep. The room was covered in darkness and I saw that entity stand in the right corner of the room. It swiftly moved near me and whispered, I warned you, in a creepy tone, and before I could react, moved to my friend's side. That entity sat on my friend's chest and disappeared. My friend woke up screaming and told me that her chest had a burning sensation. She asked me for some water to drink and I ran to the kitchen to bring her some. 
When I went back into the room to give her the water she had asked for, she fell unconscious. I woke her parents up and we rushed her to the closest hospital. Her life parted away before we reached the hospital and the doctor told us that she had a major heart attack and failed to survive it. So a few years back, me and my best friend wanted to try out a Ouija board. So I made one up and we decided we would try it in a graveyard at night. And we knew a pretty cool graveyard to try it in. It's a massive one that's locked up pretty tight at night, but me and him had climbed in quite a few times in the past. This graveyard is very overgrown and resembles a wild woodlands with dirt paths that lead around and into the center of the graveyard. And right in the center, there's an old abandoned chapel that has a memorial area at the front of the chapel. And this is where we decided to try the board. So we sit down facing each other and we ask the usual questions. And this is how it went. I asked if there were any spirits here that wanted to talk. We didn't even have to wait long and the planchette started moving very slowly over to the word yes. So we look at each other. I was kind of shocked and had a tiny doubt in my mind that my friend was the one who moved it, but we carried on. The next question I asked was what was their name? And again, the planchette started moving very slowly and it landed on the letter B and stopped and didn't seem as if it was going to move anywhere else. So I asked, is your name B? Again, it slowly moved this time to the word yes. So I ask another question. Are you male or female? Again, as before, the planchette moves very slowly and stops at the letter F and just sits there. Now I'm starting to think my friend might be messing with me, seeing as it's moving so slowly and not actually spelling out words, just stopping on letters. But I've known this friend most of my life and I trust him, even though I'm having small doubts. So I ask my next question. Are you happy? Then, for the first time, the planchette moves really fast and stops dead on the word no. And at that point, I had this really strange feeling come over me. It was like a really sharp, cold feeling. And the night seemed to get darker and really quiet, as if the wind completely stopped moving and a strange calmness took its place. I looked at my friend and he seemed to feel the same thing I was feeling. But for some reason, I didn't want to stop. So I ask, is there anything we can do to help you? The planchette moved fast again, this time to the word yes. Now I'm starting to feel fear because I'm realizing it's not my friend moving this thing. He looked afraid too, and he's a pretty tough guy. I've never seen him scared in the 15 years I've known him. I ask my last question, what can we do to help you? And this is when the planchette moved really fast and really accurately. It spelled the words, get out. We look at each other. I say, okay, goodbye. The planchette moves fast to the word goodbye. At this point, we were pretty freaked out. We stood up and literally ran through the wooded pathways until we got to the main gate and climbed out. As soon as we were outside and on the streets, everything felt normal again with the cars and lights and a couple of people walking by. We caught our breath and walked down the road, both pretty shaken up about what just happened. Was it all real? Or was it one of us subconsciously moving the planchette? I believe we actually spoke to a spirit that night. I've never done it again, but I think about that night often. I'd love to hear what you guys think of it. I used one a few times with a few friends. Nothing was really happening at first and us being the retards that we are trying to impress the girls we were with started calling out to anything, even demons. After that, we made contact with something and proceeded to ask it questions. We got a name, Garth, who apparently died in a car fire some years ago. We began to ask where in the room it was and answered. We asked for it to move an object in the room 
Nothing moved, but we did hear a noise from the other room. Anyways, after talking to Garth for about 30 minutes, we started to get bored and we were wrapping up the convo and told it we were going to end the session now. At which point the planchette went to no. We asked if it was all right for us to go. As soon as we went to say goodbye again, it went to no. After the second no, the planchette started to act weird and the atmosphere in the room changed. The planchette started moving in a circular motion and kept trying to go off the edge of the board. At which point we decided to just end the session. Upon all four of us bringing it to goodbye, the planchette stopped in the middle of the board as if it was glued in place. The girls freaked out and took their hands off the planchette. At which point my buddy and I proceeded to end the session and bring it to goodbye. For about five seconds, the planchette didn't move as the two of us tried to move it. At which point my buddy and I had to both hands like palm and all onto the planchette and forcefully drag it to goodbye. It took all our might to actually move it to goodbye. Upon trying to move the planchette, the board itself looked like it was being pulled in the opposite direction. Now some could say it was my buddy messing with me, but we were sitting next to each other and the girls were sitting across from us. So there was no way that my buddy could have been pulling in the opposite direction or holding it in place, as I could feel him always pulling my hands as well. I know we didn't end the session properly, and after typing this, I looked back and realized the two girls in the past two years, one lost her partner, baby daddy, and the other was just in a serious car wreck where she broke her spine. Makes me start to think if it could have something to do with their hands not being on the board. When I was about 20, myself, my girlfriend, eventual wife, and another couple rented a huge old farmhouse in a little unincorporated town. It's in the middle of nowhere. Our yard was about three acres with the house on one end of the property and a janky garage on the other end. The layout of the old farmhouse is important to the story. The main house itself was built in the 1890s, but had additions put on over the years. I was told it was a bunkhouse originally for a mine in the area. Miners would sleep in it in shifts. First floor, walking through the back was a mud room with the washer and dryer, water, heater, etc. Through another door was a large kitchen, sink and cabinets on the right, stove on the immediate left. Walk into a living room. From here it's a very open concept with two rooms on the left and right. Room on the right had the front door. Front door room became an office and second living room. The left room was a rotating music room, guest bedroom, whatever room. There was a lot of space. There was a full bathroom off the living room. In this bathroom, there was the rabbit hole as we called it. It was a small door about three feet tall and two and a half feet wide. This led to the basement. The basement was straight out a horror movie. One bare light bulb in the middle of the large room. Field stone walls, a couple of support beams, one key creaky stairs, and a weird tiny room behind a door made out of an old pallet. Back to the first floor living room with stairs, up about four or five stairs, then a small landing and another five or six stairs to the top. When on the landing, you can turn around and see the entire upstairs. At the top of the stairs was a tiny bathroom with a tiny window you could see the entire backyard while sitting on the toilet. There were three bedrooms, one much smaller than the other two, and it was at the very front of the house. Okay, time for the paranormal stuff. Things were kind of weird. You felt like someone was always watching you. It didn't feel scary per se, but weird. We started making jokes that the ghost was watching us, not being serious, because our house isn't haunted. We would haunt steering weight on the stairs like someone was on the landing, shuffling around. Up a stair, down a stair, move around a bit. We all just sort of thought it was an old ass house. We had two cats. One was a Garfield and the other a tuxedo cat. But he was blind in one eye and never talked. No meow. He would just open his mouth like he was trying. They would constantly stop and listen to things in the house really intently. But the tuxedo cat would run upstairs and stay up there for a while. We thought that was cat stuff. Things 
started heating up. After a few weeks, we decided to have a party in the backyard. Nothing crazy, about 15 people that we all knew. Middle of summer, so most everyone is outside by the fire except a few people in the kitchen. I'm out back by the fire yucking it up when one of my friends says, Who's that? Your grandma live here? Then proceeds to point to my bedroom window. There was what appeared to be an old lady looking out the window into the backyard, hands against her face and glass peering out. What the fuck? Is someone in my house? I start running towards the house. I can hear the chatter behind me. Someone's in the house? Same friend is following me. We get back in the door. Is someone upstairs? Everyone is saying, I don't think so. We've been right here. I get to the landing on the stairs and look around and all the doors are open. My bedroom light is on. I proceed to check the upstairs and turn all the lights on. Nothing. No one. Let alone anyone that looked like an old lady. Eventually back out by the fire, we start an inevitable conversation. Maybe the house is haunted. About a week later, my roommate brought up the idea of using a Ouija board. My girlfriend is against it. My other roommate is against it. I become the deciding vote and I say no so as to not piss off my girlfriend. Shit gets real. We can hear the desk chair upstairs roll around on its own. When you go to check it out, it's sitting in front of a window, looking out over a field. Every time, it's the same place. Roommate and I are musicians. We were trying to record some samples in the front door office. I had headphones on. Whilst playing some guitar over a drum pad, we both hear what sounded like every plate and glass get smashed on the floor in the kitchen. It was loud. We both drop everything and run into the kitchen. And there's nothing. Nothing out of place. Weird. We both couldn't believe what we heard and there was no mess. We started to wonder if we were going crazy. While pooping in the downstairs bathroom, right next to the rabbit hole, it sounded like an animal was scratching at the back of the door, trying to get into the bathroom from the basement. But the scratches were up near the top of the door and I could see it moving the door. Called the landlord and said there's an animal in the basement. He sent a guy out the next day who cleared the basement. Said there's nothing, no animals, no poop, no point of entry. The basement is sealed tight. We would hear the scratching on that door spontaneously. Others experienced it as well while in the bathroom. The house started feeling creepy, almost oppressive. It wasn't how it used to be. Someone watching, it felt like you were being stalked. Roommates and I were chilling in the main living room, playing Borderlands. We heard a cat meowing, but it was an odd, quiet, screamy kind of meow. It was from upstairs. We paused the game and head to the stairs. Once on the landing, I could see the tuxedo cat yelping and looking like he was pinned down. The Garfield cat was a few feet away, just staring and looked like a statue. I reached for him under the railing. As soon as I did, he sprang up and jumped through the railing, clutching onto me. The Garfield cat did the same, but used the roommate as a backboard, jumping off him down the stairwell. Neither wanted to go past my bedroom door, where the tuxedo cat was pinned down. We went down to the living room and just dealt with what just happened. We decided the house was haunted. Across the street was a neighbour. Nice guy in his 50s, lovely wife, a son about 6 years old. We would stand at his garage watching the NFL drink beer, all around a great relationship with them. I decided to ask him one day if he ever heard anything about the place being strange or haunted. He says, funny you say that. The previous tenant said she thought there was an old lady there. I don't believe that stuff, but now you're saying it. Her two kids used to wave to someone whenever they left. She used to feel like someone was there. My son started waving at the house too. I thought it was little kids being kids. I found it hard to believe whatever old lady in the house was trying to scare us and kill my cat. Then, we found the Ouija board. Girlfriend and I were gone for the night. Came back the next evening. Roommate was getting out of the mud room at the back of the house. Not unusual, but he looked super pale and sick. He's a dark-skinned Mexican fellow, so it was easy to see he looked pale and flush. My girlfriend had to leave and go straight to work, so I was basically just getting dropped off. He told me what happened the night before. 
C is boyfriend roommate. A is girlfriend roommate. A person who was really into paranormal activities, ghosts, spirituality, etc., brought a Ouija board into the house months before, after she asked if she could do, and we voted no. She did it anyway. She was using it when no one was home and had it hidden in the basement because she knew none of us ever went down there. The Ouija board was a mom's from the 60s or 70s, homemade, wooden, hand-painted letters and numbers. A few extra words like soon, never, later. She also said that her mother had used it for years and there was always someone called David attached to the board and David was not nice. It all made sense now. There's an old lady spirit in the house and she's pissed about David. The night A confessed to the Ouija board, she convinced C to do some EVPs with her. There were three. Basement. It was muddy. Very fuzzy, but you could hear someone distinctly say A's name. I thought maybe we were hearing what we wanted to hear. I wasn't sold on it. Main floor. It was them walking around asking questions. Are you here? What's your name, etc.? You didn't really hear much. However, there was a lot of scratchy, fuzzy bursts, like a hissing sound. Weird, but still not convinced. The stairwell. Recording was as follows from the top of the stairs. Look at the cat. He looks pissed. He sees someone. Thump. Then a louder thump. The thump. You can hear the squeal of its tires. Claws against the roof taking off. Look at him go. You okay? End of recording. To me, the thump sound was like something heavy hitting a couple stairs, then dropping some massive weight at the top of the stairs. The peculiar thing is C claimed they didn't hear anything until they played it back. By this time, it's winter in Wisconsin. There's deep snow, large drifts through the property. He tells me they used the board. They were talking to David. David was tired of talking to A. He told C about his dad being in prison in Mexico when he was a young man, about coming to the basement to see David. He hated the woman in the house because she's always stopping him from doing things, watching everyone while they sleep, hating cats, watching the girlfriend and I get intimate when no one is home, including some of the kinkier stuff no one knows about. Finally ended with C asking if he wants to know when he'll die. When C said he wants David to leave, he said he can, but won't. The whole thing took a few hours before C finally let go of the planchette and said, enough. We were now in the living room as he's telling me the story of the night before. The board is on the coffee table in the middle of the room. I'm standing with my back to the bathroom door and the door to the rabbit hole. I get this insane electric chill down my neck and spine. Goosebumps that almost hurt and I can hear the rabbit hole door getting scratched. I break for the board and say, we have to get rid of this thing. Where the fuck do we put it? At that moment, we hear the doorknob to the mudroom rattle. As we look into the kitchen, the door starts slowly opening to the mudroom. The lights are on, and there's no one there. The initial shock was unfathomable, but I knew right away the old lady opened the door, saying, get it the fuck out of the house. We stood for a moment and worked the nerve to even move. We looked at each other, amazed and terrified. I'm taking it to the garage. Don't know where else to put it. We got on our boots and coats. I wrapped the board in a paper bag and off we went. It was an almost a three acres walk that I had the small path shoveled out to the garage because I was still parked there. It was a calm night. Stars were out and the snow was really bright. As we were walking, I was carrying the board. It felt like David was following us. Just an angry tantrum feeling like we were leaving a room where a toddler was screaming and kicking the wall. The man door was old and was held closed by a bent nail. He had to spin to keep it shut. I put it on a shelf high up and left. As we left, we heard cans falling off the shelves, WD-40 and spray paint, etc. But I wasn't about to turn around and check on it. Once arriving back at the house, we felt immediate relief. Like an air purifier was running. Everything felt clean. Once again though, we were startled when the back door opened. We automatically prepared for the worst. We waited for the mudroom to open. 
It was my other friend, who was a regular to the house, so much so he would walk right in. He saw us looking terrified and asked what happened. We gave him a sigh of relief. He'd had his own experiences in the house and knew we were serious. We sat and chatted for hours about the whole ordeal. Mind you, there are a lot of experiences in that house I haven't touched on, but these were some of the major ones. Undeniably paranormal. In 2003, I was a 20 year old recently single mother of a one year old son. When the father of my then child, now children, moved out, I had no desire to live alone in my apartment. So my two best friends, Heather and Jamie, moved in. Jamie also had a son who was a little over a year old at the time. The five of us made a little home and things were good. At some point, and I've tried so hard to remember how it started, but can't, Jamie, Heather and I became kind of addicted to using a Ouija board. I had bought this board at Kmart for like $8 one year, and I think it was for that reason that I didn't take it very seriously. Boy, was I wrong. When we first started using it, I remained pretty sceptical, even as it began to tell us some pretty accurate and intimate things. Looking back, I always thought that Jamie was the one moving the oracle. I knew it wasn't Heather because at times, she was legitimately afraid. One day, I fought with the father of my sons, super upset and crying. I hopped in my car by myself and just went for a cry drive. At the peak of being upset and alone in the car, I said aloud, is this my destiny or am I supposed to fight to save this? I went home to the loving arms of my friends. As we, as we did most nights, we got out the board. The very first thing the board said that night was, destiny changes with every breath. Neither of them could have possibly known what I had just said in the car. That was the point when my skepticism started to fade away. We continued to use the board pretty much every night. And it continued to tell us things that would come true. At this point, the entity had claimed to be our collective spirit guide, Ben. One night, we had a male friend at the apartment. He was asleep on the couch behind us as we sat in our circle on the floor around the board. Heather remembered something from that night that I didn't until she mentioned it recently. She felt a cold pressure wrap around her arm and then shoot up her nose. She started to freak out. But as I already told you, she was the scaredy cat of the group. I was more annoyed than worried or scared. We convinced us to sit back down. And that's when the board said something about not being happy that our male visitor was there. Almost immediately, he sat straight up on the couch and said, what are you doing to me? He lifted his shirt and he had several tiny handprints all over his chest and stomach. That was likely the point when I realized that we might be dealing with something darker than what it was selling itself as. What I didn't know then is that it would get much worse. We went to the local library and got some books about the occult. We brought them home, but never looked at them. Until one night, the three of us and the two babies had been out somewhere. We came home and put the boys in the playpen. I started running the vacuum. As I was running the vacuum, I heard Heather and Jamie screaming hysterically. I stopped to find out what was happening. And that's when they told me that they had heard a very loud thump and then a child screaming bloody murder. They thought one of the boys had fallen from the playpen and gotten hurt, but both boys were still peacefully playing where we had left them, and when they went in to check. As they're telling me this, I was suddenly overcome by the smell of rotten meat. I'm a bit of a neat freak, and therefore, there shouldn't have been anything causing the smell. I started searching high and low for the source of the smell. But it seemed to keep moving every time I got close to it. Meanwhile, Heather grabbed one of the roughly five books we had picked up from the library, opened it to a random page, and started reading. She said, You have to come read this. Annoyed, I replied, I can't stop until I found where the smell is coming from. Very sternly, she said again, You have to come read this. I look at her, and she was ghost white with tears streaming down her face. I walked over and took the book from her. The first paragraph of the front page to which she had randomly opened the book said, the scream of a non-present child, accompanied by the smell of rotten fish, signifies the presence of pure evil. I wish I could tell you what we did in the following minutes. I don't remember. What I do remember is the next day, we took all of the books back to the library and got a Bible. We brought it home, left it open on a chair in the living room and left for the rest of the day. 
I'm not even a religious person, but it's funny what you'll do when you're scared. We never used to board in that apartment again. If that story is the cake, this is the icing. Fast forward to June of 2004. I had given birth to my second son in February. Jamie and I were living in a different apartment and Heather was living with a boyfriend. Heather came to visit and for whatever reason we broke out the board. I only remember one question from that day. Heather said to the board, Jamie has a son. She has two sons. When will I ever have children? And the board replied, seven for you. So that became a running joke for the next several months. Like, haha, Heather's going to have seven kids. Fast forward again, this time to January of 2005. I live with my children in yet another apartment. Jamie has moved in with her now husband and Heather is living with a different boyfriend. I was laying in bed one night and seven for you just popped into my head. Suddenly, it hit me. The board had said that in June, and it was now January. July, August, September, October, November, December. January. Seven months. Duh. Heather is pregnant now. I called her the next day to tell her she was pregnant. She was very adamant that it was not possible. To shorten the back and forth that we did for the next two weeks. Yes, she absolutely was pregnant. She gave birth to her first son in October of 2005. Since then, we've done the math. She was only about two weeks pregnant when I first told her. Although we're still for all friends, I don't know a lot about what they've experienced paranormal-wise in the years since. I know that Heather had some pretty scary experiences in a house she lived in up until last year, where a previous tenant had committed suicide. I lived in the parsonage of a church for 10 years, and we had some pretty strange experiences there, including a time that my younger sister and I watched a full grocery bag that was hanging on a doorknob lift off the door until it was completely horizontal and then drop back down. Even my sceptical mom saw shadow figures in that house. Now we're in a new house and my son and my brother are having some unusual experiences in the basement, which is where their bedrooms are. My house has been haunted all my life. It started in the apartment I lived in as a kid, but it followed me to where I'm currently living. In the past 10 years, I've experienced more paranormal activity than most people have in their lives. It started with an attachment I had from using a Ouija board at 11 years old. Since I've so many paranormal experiences to share, I'm going to limit this to the things that have taken place in my current home, with a focus on the more significant things to take place here over the years. I'm 21, but when I moved into my current home, I was 13. I was living with both my parents, four cats and a dog, and now it's myself, my dad, my girlfriend, three cats and a dog living here. The history of the house isn't very important. We bought it from a family. The woman that lived in the house had been moved to a hospice where she passed away, and her kids were selling her condo. Her name was Helen. That is as much significant history as there is to my current home. Outside of that, it seems that the entities in our home aren't necessarily attached to the location as much as they're attached to us. A little background on the spirits in my house. I know Helen is here. She's been heard by multiple people. She has a distinct old lady perfume and a calming feeling that comes along with her. We also have unknown number of spirits or entities in the basement. I have a hard time explaining them because I don't know if there are multiple male human spirits or one inhuman spirit, making it seem like more than one. But whatever it is feels dark and masculine, if that makes sense. Helen mainly stays upstairs, and whatever is dark typically stays in the basement. The main floor is typically the more poltergeist type activity. That being said, now into some specific experiences. One day, I was probably around 14 at the time, I was in my bed late at night responding to Snapchat shrieks, but being a teen laying in bed, makeup probably off, I didn't feel like sending pictures of my face, or really putting any effort in. But I also just didn't want to send a black screen, so I was taking pictures of my bedroom door, because our whole light was on. After snapping and sending a few photos, my camera started struggling to focus. It wouldn't take the picture because it just kept trying to focus. Finally, the picture was taken and a dark black figure was peering in at me in the photo. 
It was out of focus, and of course, I freaked out. I looked up and saw nothing, so I snapped another photo, and that one came out clear, and there was no figure. At that time, I'd say it was the beginning of things taking a turn for the worse. A few days passed, and I had gotten three scratches down my back in the shower. My aunt had heard about what I was experiencing, and I had a friend who was a Wiccan priest. I will say, I wasn't necessarily open-minded to a Wiccan. It seemed like bullshit at first, but this man had told me that there are always ways we can open portals between our worlds and others. Sometimes intentionally, but not always. He told me that candles give off a pure white light, but when set in front of a mirror, that light doubles and turns impure or dark. It's hard to explain, but I understood it as candle alone equals good. Candle in front of a mirror equals bad. He said if you have a candle in front of a mirror and look into it, that can open a portal to a darker dimension. Again, as he was first telling me this, I was thinking bullshit. But then I remember just days before, I had seen the figure in my bedroom. I had taken a photo sitting in front of my bedroom mirror with a candle damn near in my lap. He told me to throw a sheet over the mirror without looking into it and to get rid of it or remove it or whatever. My dad did so and the second the sheet covered the mirror, the power went out only in my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. That's when I started to take the stuff more seriously. A little while passed and things seemed a little less dark or aggressive, but something was definitely still there. That's when the event occurred that caused us to call a priest to come bless our home and myself. I had been home alone one day and had an experience that's hard for me to explain. Other people will simply say I was possessed for a few hours, but for me, it's more confusing than that. I have a lapse in time, in memory, where people are telling me I did things I don't remember doing. I remember being on FaceTime with my best friend. I had walked into my upstairs bathroom, which is weirdly a hot spot for activity in the house. The same room I got scratched. After walking in the bathroom, I don't remember anything else until hours later. So what I type from here until I snap out of it is told to me by witnesses, if that makes sense. My best friend said while on FaceTime, the light started flickering in the bathroom and I just stopped talking and was staring up ahead past my phone. My friend asked what was wrong and I responded with, I can't leave. There's something blocking the door. Right away, she knew something wasn't right and told me to just go out. But I guess I ended up hanging up the phone. We had another friend who lived like two blocks away from me, so my best friend called her and told her she needed to check on me. When she got to my house, she looked for me everywhere. Upstairs, main floor, basement, and looked in every room, but I was nowhere to be found. Just as she was coming down the stairs to leave, I was standing in the middle of the main floor. If you walked in my house, you couldn't have missed me. So she asked where I came from and that she was looking for me. She said I responded so calmly and eerily, it was, wasn't like it was me talking. I told her I'd been in the bathroom and she said, no, you weren't. I just looked there. Once she said I completely changed and she couldn't tell it arranged me. I told her she needed to leave and I even said, you aren't welcome here. Being a 14 year old girl talking to one of her best friends, that's definitely not like me. She tried to argue about leaving, but apparently the more she did, the more aggressive I got about getting her out. So out of fear, she left and her and my friends just kept trying to call and text me to snap me out of it. Three hours passed and no one knew what I was up to. I posted a picture on my Snapchat story of myself in the mirror that was covered the effing portal mirror with the caption saying something about it being time to stop being scared or stop running or something super creepy. The next thing I remember is sitting on the couch and the best way I can describe it is like this. It felt like waking up from a nap, except I didn't remember falling asleep or even going to sit on the couch. After that, we had done a little more research and talked with the priest and Wiccan. I ended up finding out I had an attachment that I created with a Ouija board at 11 and then only strengthened with the mirror portal. I was blessed and so was the house and for a long time, things were better.
In the spring of 1988, an El Salvadorian family of five moved into their new house in Houston, Texas. The family was made of a 13-year-old Maltrejo, her f- mother Chavez, her father Jose, her younger sister Jackie, and her older sister Maria. Because of the house's small size, the sisters did not have separate rooms. Thus, all three of them had to sleep in a single bedroom, and they were not particularly excited about it. Jose, however, was extremely happy when they moved into this house, as he believed he could carve a better future for his wife and daughters by staying in the United States. A few weeks after moving into the house, while the family were having their dinner together, Maria talked about a board game that gave answers to every asked question, and this board was called the Ouija board. She insisted that the family could play together and pleaded with Chavez to get the board for her. Although Chavez did not know much about this game worked, she decided to get it for her daughter since all of them could play it. When Chavez finally got them a Ouija board, the girls ran into their room with excitement to play with it. Maria had a blatant idea about how to play this game and the three rules that should be followed, but she wasn't particularly sure about what these three rules were. So, she read out loud the rules on the sheet that came with the board. This sheet had three rules, and they were never play alone, always say goodbye when you're done playing, and never play in your own house. Despite reading these rules, the girls instantly broke the third rule as they started playing with this board in their own house. They placed the planchette on the board, placed their fingers on the planchette, and Maria asked the board, Is anybody there? As they didn't get any response, Maria asked the same question for the second time, and even this time nothing happened. By then, Chavez came into their room and she watched the girls play with their new game. Maria asked the question for the third time, and the planchette started moving towards the word yes. As everyone kept staring at the board in astonishment, Jackie started laughing and revealed that she was the one moving it. As the board didn't seem to work, The sisters lost interest in it and left the room after pushing it under Mel's bed. Mel had just gotten into middle school and she was finding it really hard to make friends. To make it worse, a girl named Erica was terribly bullying her and she was scared to walk out of her classroom. Every day after school, Mel would go back to her home feeling extremely sad and she felt like she had no one to open up to about the situation. As things were getting worse day by day, Mel decided to use the Ouija board to open up. When Mel greeted the board, nothing seemed to happen at first, but within a few moments, the planchette started moving around the board and it spelt hi. After this, Mel asked if it could help her get rid of a bully, and the planchette moved to yes. The next day, when Mel went to school, she heard her teacher announce Erica's permanent exclusion from the school. After school, Mel rushed back to her room and asked the Ouija board if it was behind Erica's expulsion. To her surprise, it replied yes, and the next moment, the planchette moved across the board all on its own to spell out, I am your friend. Without Mel asking any questions, Mel was happy that she finally had a friend. That night, Mel's parents went out on a date, leaving their daughters all alone in the house. As they kept watching TV while sitting in the living room, Mel started feeling a sharp pain in her head, and she went into the kitchen to take a painkiller. While Mel was about to walk out of the kitchen, she started hearing footsteps from the house's fenced backyard, and they kept getting closer and closer, only to suddenly stop. As Mel slowly peeked out of the kitchen window, a terrifying demonic face suddenly appeared right on the window. Mel screamed her lungs off and ran to the living room in fear. When Maria asked her what happened, Mel told her about the demonic face. To see what this face was, Marie gathered up her two sisters and slowly walked towards the kitchen. On their way, they started to hear footsteps coming from the floor above them, and the ceiling above started to creak. It appeared as if someone heavy was walking upstairs. Thinking they had an intruder, the girls grabbed their shoes as weapons and slowly walked upstairs. Following the sound of footsteps, they reached their parents' closed bedroom. As Mel started twisting the doorknob, the footsteps suddenly stopped, and when the girls turned on the lights after entering the room, they found no one. As they stood there staring at the empty room, Chavez and Jose returned home. The girls rushed to their parents and told them about what had happened, but Jose's eyes rolled back and he uncharacteristically shouted at them, asking them to go to bed at once. Jose had never acted like that before 
and it appeared as if something had taken control of him. The time Mel spent with the Ouija board increased gradually with time, and at one point, all she cared about was spending more time with it. Maria and Chavez were getting worried about her obsession with the board, but they weren't able to stop her from using it. As this kept continuing, one night, Mel woke up from her sleep because of the sound of loud dragging footsteps in her room, and these footsteps seemed to be walking towards her. When slowly got down from her bed to see who was walking in her room, something grabbed her leg and started dragging her under the bed. Using all her strength, Mel escaped its clutches and pulled herself onto Maria's bed. Hearing Mel scream, her parents rushed to her bedroom. When Mel told her mother about what had just happened, she felt that her daughter was imagining things. According to Chavez, Mel's obsession with the Ouija board was the reason behind this occurrence. So, with the help of her husband, she grabbed the Ouija board from her daughter and threw it into a dumpster outside their house. After her mother snatched away the Ouija board from her, Mel started to miss her newly found friend who communicated with her through it. So one day, she decided to make her own board with cut out letters and she used an inverted drinking glass as the planchette. When she tried communicating with her mysterious friend using a handmade board, her new friend responded. When Mel asked this spirit about its gender, the inverted glass moved around and spelt female. One night, when Mel was walking towards the kitchen to grab a glass of water, she heard eerie, nonsensical chanting coming from the living room of the house. When she walked to the living room to see what she was making these chants, she saw her father. He was making these chants with his eyes rolled back and it appeared as he was under the control of someone else. That night onwards, Mel's father's behaviour completely changed. The very next night, when Maria and Jackie were in the living room, their father stormed into the house and walked up straight to their mother to start an argument. He was extremely aggressive and his voice made Mel tremble in fear. So, she immediately used her handmade board and asked her spirit friend if she could make him go away and the board spelt yes. The very next moment, Maria started feeling intense heat, and she started to feel extreme rage. Possessed by this unknown rage, she grabbed her father's loaded gun and pointed it towards her father. With her father saying that she didn't have the guts to shoot him, the situation started to grow more tense, and it made Maria pull the trigger. Luckily, her mom pushed her arm up and the bullet hit the ceiling instead of her father. Hearing the gun sound, Maria came back down to his senses and claimed that something took her over. Chavez felt something evil was there in the house, and thus, she along with her daughters moved away from their house and settled in another apartment. Mel was finding it hard to adapt to life without her father, and this pushed her more towards the Ouija board. One afternoon, while playing with the board, Mel asked her friend where she had come from, and the moving drinking glass on the board moved around spelling from hell. This answer freaked Mel out and she ran away from the room after putting all the cut out letters inside the drinking glass. Just after taking a few steps, Mel heard a loud shattering sound from her room and it stopped her. When she walked back to her room to see what caused this sound, she saw the drinking glass that she used as a planchette shattered in pieces and the cut out letters she used for her Ouija board were shredded and flying around. Mel's mysterious spirit friend started showing her violent side. As she stood in the room, Mel heard whispers in her ears, and they asked her to check under her bed. When she anxiously slid her hand under the bed, she found the original Ouija board that her parents had previously dumped. Later that night, Chavez was woken up from her sleep because of feeling extremely cold. When she opened her eyes to correct her blanket, she started hearing footsteps in the hallway. The door of Chavez's room did not have a knob fitted in the des designated hole, and thus it had a small opening in the place of the knob. So, she slowly walked out of her bed and peeked through the hole in the door to see who was walking in the hallway. The moment she peeked through this hole, the footsteps stopped, but the very next moment, the demonic face of a woman suddenly appeared in front of her. Chavez fell back on the floor in fear, but she gathered herself up and peeked through this hole again only to find the demonic face missing. She immediately rushed to her daughter's room to make sure they were safe, and much to her relief, they were indeed safe. One evening, when the family were getting ready for dinner, Mel suddenly got a feeling of being watched by someone. 
When she told her mom about it, she immediately shut her down, thinking she was trying to escape from helping her prepare the dinner. After she finished cooking, Chavez asked Mel to get the dinner plates. When Mel walked towards the shelf to get the plates, she saw a demonic creature standing in the living room, and before she called her mom to show it to her, it disappeared. A few minutes later, she was pushed onto the couch in her living room by something invisible, and she passed out because of falling short of breath. As Mel's mom was trying to bring her back to consciousness, she suddenly sat upright, and with her eyes closed, started gesturing with her hands wildly. Her skin started turning purple, and it appeared as if she was being possessed. Mel fell unconscious again, and when she woke up, she had completely forgotten the events that preceded. After this event, Mel became really sick, and despite Chavez taking her to multiple doctors, she was not able to have her daughter cured. A family friend suggested taking Mel to a witch doctor named Alice, and Chavez obliged. After examining Mel, Alice concluded that something evil was breaking Mel down. She made Mel sit in front of a mirror, made her close her eyes, and asked Chavez to look at her reflection. When Chavez looked into the mirror, she saw the same demonic face she had seen previously through the hole in her door appear instead of her daughter's reflection. The figure screamed, and the mirror shattered into pieces. When Alice asked her if she had any recent interaction with something paranormal, she told her about her new friend from hell, whom she communicated with using the Ouija board. Alice told Chavez that an exorcism should be performed on her daughter, and she instructed her to burn the board. So, Chavez called Jose, told him about the location of the board, and asked him to burn it immediately. Alice began the exorcism, and she started sprinkling holy water on Mel. For Mel, who was covered under a cloth, however, these hitting water droplets felt like painful punches. Meanwhile, Jose got hold of the board and set it on fire. When the board was burning, Mel felt as if she herself was burning from the inside, and this pain was unbearable for her. Finally, when the Ouija board completely turned into ashes, Mel collapsed on the floor, and she was back to her original self. The paranormal events that followed her ceased after burning the Ouija board. 